grocery store receipts show that their customer purchases have a right skewed distribution with a population mean of $32 and a population standard deviation of $20. Let's begin with this first question. Can we determine the probability of one randomly selected receipt being more than $37? If so, calculate it and interpret your answer. All right, so this is something you've worked on earlier, and you already know that in order to calculate the probability of one randomly selected being in an interval, such as more than $37, you need three things. You need to know the center of the distribution. You got that, the population mean. You need to know the spread. You got that, the population standard deviation. And you need to know that the shape is normal. Well, you don't have that. So no, for population distributions, we only know how to work with the ones that have a normal shape. Since this population is right skewed, we cannot calculate any probabilities for it, or at least not for probabilities of one randomly selected being in some interval. Okay, so let's try the next one. Can we determine the probability of 10 randomly selected receipts having a sample mean that's more than $37? If so, calculate it and interpret your answer. Okay, now we're working with the sampling distribution for the sample mean, because not one is being randomly selected, but more than one, 10 in fact. So the question is, will those sample means, in other words, all the possible sample means we could ever possibly get from repeated sampling, where each one is from a random sample of 10, will they cluster around the population mean so nice and close that they'll take on a normal distribution? even though the population we're sampling from is right skewed? So the answer is no. Though we are working with a sampling distribution for the sample mean, so you're feeling a little hopeful, the sampling distribution will become more normal as the sample size n increases. The sample size n needs to be at least 30 before we can say our sampling distribution is normal and thus be able to calculate the probability that they asked for. A sample size of 10 is not large enough if we're sampling from a skewed population. Can we determine the probability of 44 randomly selected receipts having a sample mean that's more than $37? If so, calculate it and interpret your answer. All right, now we're talking. Like we were just talking about, a sampling distribution for the sample mean will become more and more normal as the sample size n increases. So as that sample size increases to at least 30 or more, then we're going to say those sample means are going to be clustering around that population mean nice and close where they develop a normal distribution. And that's what's happening here. So yes, our random sample is at least 30, so our sampling distribution will be approximately normal, and thus we will be able to calculate the probability that they asked for. So we're ready to do the calculation, but you know what we're going to use? We're going to use that three-page template that I gave you that's going to step you through the process so you learn the maximum amount for the time you invested in these exercises and homework problems. All right, here's the first page of that template that I gave you. And it reminds you of the questions you want to ask yourself on every problem you do that tell you which distribution you have. And I don't care if you already know which distribution it is. You need the practice of actually asking yourself these questions and answering them on every problem you do. Because unless you practice that, you're not going to get good at it. This is a huge skill for you. Because once you master this, 
then when you're taking an exam, you're going to have an easy time identifying which problem is which. Because on the exam, these things are all jumbled together. It really lowers your stress level about exams when you have this skill. All right, so let's go through here. What are they asking for? Well, they were asking for a probability. And in our sketch, that'll be an area under the curve. Of course, that tells us we're going to be using the normal CDF function on our TI calculator. Next question, what type of data is it? Well, for us, it's either quantitative or binary. Quantitative, if we're measuring something from each individual or observational unit from our population or sample. And binary, if we're placing each individual or observational unit into one of two categories. Well, these are receipts, which are a measurement of how much money was spent. So we are quantitative data. Next question, going down our flow chart. How many were randomly sampled? It's either one or more than one. Which was it? Well, it was 44. That's more than one. Well, where does that point to? Ah, now we know. We're working with a sampling distribution for the sample mean. And look what few questions it took. One, what are they asking for? A probability. What type of data is it? Quantitative. How many were randomly sampled? More than one. And of course, to double check yourself, anytime they ask you to find a probability of the sample mean being an interval, that right there would tell you it's a sampling distribution for the sample mean. So let's go to the second page, which is step two. All right, here we are at step number two. What are we doing here? Well, in step one, we identified which of these four distributions it is. You know, either it's going to be a population distribution, sampling distribution for the sample mean, sampling distribution for the sample proportion. Okay, we haven't covered that yet, but we will in the next lesson. And of course, all of these we're going to find can be turned into the standard normal distribution after being standardized. So of all these four, which one do we have? Sampling distribution for the sample mean. All right, so the point of this is now let's review what we need to know about the sampling distribution for the sample mean. I mean, these are the big important concepts. This is the concepts we're going to be applying in our homework. That's the whole point of the homework and practice exercises is that we're going to apply these concepts and by applying them, that's what makes them easy to remember. And if we can remember them, we're going to understand inferential statistics because this sampling distribution for the sample mean is the foundation for all the inferential statistical methods we're going to learn about for quantitative data. So yeah, it's kind of a big deal. So how do I know that this distribution of all the possible sample means I could ever possibly get from repeated sampling is normal? Well, we see there's two ways it can happen. They don't both have to happen, only one. Either we have a sample size of 30 or more, or the population we're sampling from is normal. Well, our population we're sampling from isn't normal, but that's okay because we had a sample size that was at least 30. Great, so we got our shape. Center, well, all those sample means cluster around the population mean. So the population mean is in the center and they gave us that value. So we're good there. The spread is given by this formula, which the smart mathematicians figured out. We actually know this is how closely all the possible sample means will cluster around the population mean with repeated sampling. So we take our population standard deviation, which was given to us, divide by the square root of the sample size, which is 44, and we actually know what the typical distance is between a sample mean and the population mean. That's what the spread is. Great, all right, so that was the purpose of step number two, to review the shape, center, and spread of the distribution we're working with. Now you go to the final step three where you fill out the template. 
All right, now this is where we're doing our work. Step number one and step number two was just getting us ready to fill out this template. And what you want to do, fill out this template on every exercise you do, especially when you're just starting out, because this is going to remind you of all the steps, all the concepts you need to think about and apply on every exercise you do so you learn the maximum amount. Because without this, you'll always wonder, oh, did I forget something? Did I forget the concept I was supposed to think about? Don't worry about it. You got the template to lead you through. So first question, and you'll notice the first questions here, we've already answered thanks to steps one and two. So these will go pretty easy for you. What type of data is this? Well, in our flow chart, we said that was quantitative data. So you check that one off. Also, we answered how many were randomly sampled? More than one, 44. Check that one off. Now you know which type of distribution it is. Once again, we did this in step one. The flow chart told us it was the sampling distribution for the sample mean. So check that one off. Now, what were you given and what were you asked to find? We addressed this too in uh, step number one. And we were given an interval and asked to find the area under the curve. So check that one off. And while you're at it, put a check by normal CDF. That's the function we'll need to use. All right, so let's scroll on down so that uh, we can make our sketch. All right, here we are. We're going ready to make our sketch. Now let's fill this in. We know which distribution we're working with, so let's label it. So what goes in that little box here to the right of it? It's the distribution of all the possible sample means we could get. So put a sample mean in there, a little X bar. There you go. Always label your distributions because, you know, we got all these different ones. Uh, you want to be clear which one you're talking about. Step number two, we review the shape, center, and spread. So go ahead and let's fill those in now. The shape is normal because the sample size was large, at least 30. The center, well, the center is equal to the population mean, and they told us the population mean was 32. Put that in there. We got a little calculating to do for the spread, but it's pretty easy. Just take our population standard deviation, which they gave us, which is 20, divided by the square root of the sample size, which we know is 44, and let's calculate that. I'm going to go out four decimal places because I'm going to need this as an intermediate calculation later on. For our sketch here, we want to put the numbers under each of these tick marks over here. So we got the center, so let's put 32 in the center. Now using our spread, let's get the other numbers, but let's make it easy. Let's just round off our spread to three which is fine for our sketch. Now in our calculation, we'll use more accuracy, but for a sketch, three is good enough. So add three and subtract three from 32, the mean, and you've got the interval that contains the middle 68% of all the possible sample means you could get. Let's go out another above and below, and you've got the interval that contains the middle 95% of all the possible sample means you could ever possibly get from repeated sampling, which is between $26 and $38. Now for the interval that pretty much contains all the means, or 99.7% of them, are within three of these tick marks, or standard errors, and those come out to 23 to 41. All the possible sample means we could get taken from random samples of size 44 will be between $23 and $41. What we're looking for is all the sample means that are larger than 37. Because they said, can we determine the probability of 44 randomly selected receipts having a sample mean that's more than $37? So locate 37 on there. So you put that line in there. Their next question is, now which side do I shade? The right side or the left side? So you read carefully what they asked for, and they said more than $37. So all the sample means that are more than are to the right. 
shade it in. All right, so that's a picture of your answer. That's the proportion of sample means that will be greater than 37. And that's the probability of your sample mean being more than $37. Put the X bar next to your 37 here, but put it on the side that you shade it. Did I got to put it on the right side then? All right, now compare these two. Sample mean with the 37, and who is larger? Well, whoever is farther to the right is larger. So the X bar gets the large end of the inequality. 37 is smaller, so it gets a small end of the inequality. So put it in. Now I'll just put parentheses around that, slap a capital P in front, and there's your notation. All correct. All right, let's continue on down here. We used our sketch to help us write out the inequality notation. Now let's write out the TI function you're using, which we know is normal CDF, along with the inputs used to get your answer. So we can see that for normal CDF, first we give it the lower bound. And notice our sketch really helps us with this. We, from our sketch, we can see, yep, the lower bound is 37. The upper bound's going off to positive infinity. So anything way, way larger than, say, 41 for this particular sampling distribution will work fine. 100, 100's way off to the right. That'd be great if you don't want even think about it, just use something really huge like 1 times 10 raised to the 99th power. So that's what I got here, 1e99. E then the center of our sampling distribution, which is 32, and then the spread of our sampling distribution, which we had just calculated earlier. You punch that into your TI calculator and you get 4.86%. I want you to notice the next thing it says to do. This is very, very valuable. Take the answer that you got from your TI calculator and put it onto your sketch above. So do that. Once again, that reinforces what your answer means. It's the area under the curve. Because what does the area under the curve tell us? Well, that's what we're going to answer next, and we're going to write it out in words. Because it says state your results in the context of a probability. So what we're going to say is there is a 4.86% probability that the sample mean from the random sample of 44 receipts will be more than $37. Is this considered an unusual event? Put a check next to yes, because the probability is less than 5%. Because our general rule is if a probability is 5% or less, we're going to say it's small enough to be considered unusual. State your result in the context of a proportion. 4.86% of all the sample means from random samples of 44 receipts will be more than $37. All right. So you see everything we did there? You do that. On every problem you do, you will master this because you're applying all the important, valuable concepts you need to master, and you are going to understand sampling distributions. And once you understand sampling distributions, the rest of statistics is so much easier. Everything will make sense. Everything will fall into place and life will be good.